All right. All right, you guys. Let me fix that a little bit. So today we're talking about uh, thyroid and uh, on the Dr. G show. I'm glad to have you guys on today. Uh, it's live. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think this is episode 94. And so we've been doing this for a little while now. And I think we've covered thyroid a couple other times. And what we want to do today is maybe talk about it in a more general sense and then kind of see where patients go with, or not patients, but where you guys go with this. Hey Kim, good to have you on. Uh, as you guys join, please uh, feel free to share this. Thyroid's a pretty big deal for most people um, and it controls everything. So thyroid is everything from uh, puberty, uh, sexual functioning, every single cell in your body it relies on thyroid to actually function and work. It's your basal metabolic rate. Uh, everything that makes you feel awesome comes down to thyroid. So it becomes this really interesting, perplexing thing uh, for which a lot of people end up having lots of thyroid problems. And there's lots of different things that people do for thyroid. And some of them are very helpful, some of them are bull crap, and some of them uh, are harmful to it. So as we go through this today, I want you guys to feel free to post questions. And uh, if you have comments or whatever, unless it's about my hair looking crazy today, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, looks like I combed it with a uh, chicken bone or something today. So, hey Ruben. Um, hey Terry. So, post questions, we'll, we'll try to get through this. Uh, and then I have a little bit of a, like a, a idea. And you know, we have our 100th show coming up. Um, we're gonna have Holly on. So we want an idea of like, maybe what could we do uh, that would be interesting to you guys. So we need a 100th show extravaganza. Maybe we should have just a bunch of people on. I don't know. Drink. Martinis, taste a bunch of different foods. I don't know. Hey, one thing too, um, you know, we used to have these patient um, lunches or patient dinners where everybody would bring in all these kind of gluten-free, dairy-free, healthy ideas. And then uh, we'd have the recipe cards for them. And so all these people that had food sensitivities too, they could go and, and, and um, uh, all eat together and for once have a bunch of people that are really right tribe. So a lot of people that are doing these things that are really healthy, changing their lifestyle, they don't have other people to really collaborate with, and most people just talk a bunch of smack. So, hey Martha, thank you. Um, so it ends up being kind of frustrating, you know, and, and isolating, kind of lonely uh, as you're making these changes. And so I learned that, um, hey, Carrie McDowell's on here, so how do you say uh, hello in Australian? So I was, crikey, mate! <laughs> Um, well, that's now I'm distracted here. All right, so listen. Uh, Monday, this Monday, I, th I, don't, I think it's the first Monday of each month, maybe, at the First Universalist Unitarian Church, um, they have a vegan potluck night. So that's a really great one for a lot of us to get together and kind of have like, oh, good eye, mate. So there we go. Right, so <laughs> put a couple of shrimp on the bobby. See, how's that? All right. Um, so it's really cool. It's, it's great when you get to eat with a whole bunch of other people that all are like about what you're doing. And that's the amazing thing. So it, it's this thing, uh, very synergistic, and you like look at all these different foods that everybody was eating. I know I post a lot of stuff, and half the people are like, can I come over? I'm like, Sure, but I'm doing it at like 10 o'clock at night and people should come over. Have a martini, have a little gimlet and we can make some vegetarian food. But And you don't have to be vegetarian. You can eat meat if you want to. It's just one of those things that I always tell patients, eat really great vegetarian food and add meat if you want. That way it's all about the vegetables and fruits and nuts and seeds and greens, but flavor too. All right. Um... So, we're gonna talk about thyroid. I wanna hear your guys' thyroid questions. I wanna hear some of the myths. So we're gonna talk about some of the myths that a lot of people treat. And I love that because it pisses a lot of doctors off uh, that do this work and 
when I used to teach the postdoc program, lots of arguments. So I'm not shy of away from arguments. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about thyroid first. So uh, how does the thyroid work, right? So we have this thyroid that's right here. Um, I actually had hyperthyroid or Graves disease in my 20s and they wanted to take my thyroid out. And so I went to um, my primary and he said, oh, your thyroid test really, uh, it's crazy high, your TSH. Well, my TSH was almost gone because that's the, it's the opposite. But So he said, you have Graves disease. And um, I said, well, what are we gonna do? And he said, well, we'll just cut it out and, and you'll be fine. And I was like, well, you're not cutting anything out. What, why do I have this, why? And so he's like, oh, we just don't know. You know, I'll, I'll send you to the endocrinologist and, and, and he will know. He said he. That's a bit condescending, right? A little sexist to say that. Uh, so, turns out it was a guy, though. If it was a woman, she probably would have known, <laughs> known some answers here. But I went to this guy who's an endocrinologist, and, um, you know, he said, well, uh, both, you know, kind of explained the labs and said, okay, do you want to schedule a surgery this time? I was like, no, wait, wait, wait why is my thyroid messed up? And he goes, well, we just don't know. It's a big mystery. We can do a bunch of tests, but we're just gonna chop it out no matter what. And I was just like, nope. I don't know how to fix this. I don't know what the hell's going on, but I know I'm 20 something and you are not cutting stuff out of me that I probably need. So uh, that being said, eventually I made enough changes uh, and luckily that autoimmune thyroiditis is gone. So that's, that's wonderful. Now we help lots of patients with this. So it's, it's not that big of a deal, but back then I, I had no clue what to do. So we have this thyroid. If the thyroid is not working very well, so th think of it like this is your basal, beta, basal metabolic rate for your whole body, for, for your reproductive system, for your hormones, for your cells, for your brain. So if the thyroid is not working very well and it's slow or hypothyroid, hypo meaning low, uh, then everything slows down you start getting sluggish thoughts like brain fog, and then you start you know, slowing down your basal metabolic rate, so the same amount of food now starts making you gain weight. So, and your libido just goes, right? Lower than the average American now these days, which is already low. So, it's not a very fun thing, right? And then you have the opposite, uh, and that's what I had, and man, you feel freaking invincible. I didn't need sleep. Oh man, it was great. I could eat where the hell I want. I was burning energy like crazy. So the hyperthyroid is too much thyroid. The hyperthyroid is hyper functioning. And so you're just dumping tons of this thyroid into everything. So your basal metabolic rate goes through the roof and uh, you can't sleep, you can't, you know, you know, and eventually, you know, I get just these horrible painful headaches and I could feel blood pumping through my arms. That was the weirdest feeling ever. And so like I could feel it just pumping. I could feel it pumping in my neck. Uh, so that part wasn't so great, but I thought, well, with every superhero kind of experience, you have the downside too, right? You know, so it was okay. I didn't need sleep. I could get so much stuff done. My brain was just like hyper acute. Um, and so then when I got, when I got things fixed, it was weird because I felt normal and it was just like, ugh, is this what normal feels like? This is so boring. So, um, I kind of missed it for a while. So, haven't ever taken meth, but I'm pretty sure hyperthyroid is what meth probably feels like. But you get to keep your teeth, so that's pretty good. Uh, so hyper versus hypo, right? Um, and then, let's talk about how the thyroid functions. It's, it's, it's very simple, and this is why I love teaching the postdoc kind of stuff or postgrad stuff on thyroid, because it's really a simple thing. Um, so you have your uh, brain here, somewhere here, um, and then in the middle of your brain, somewhere about mm, here, you have a hypothalamus. Hey, Marcia, glad you joined. Uh, hi, Amber. Uh, so in the middle of that, you have a brain stem. So you have your brain, and then you have your brain stem. And before that, in front of the brain stem, you have what's called the hypothalamus, and then you have this pituitary that hangs down. And the pituitary is called the master gland, but the hypothalamus is the master of the master gland. So it's kind of like the man saying, oh, I'm the master of the house, but really it's the woman that's the master of the house. So the pituitary, the not really the master, uh, just makes a bunch of hormones. So yeah, anterior and posterior. And, um, and so it's gonna make a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone. 
and thyroid stimulating hormone is probably what most docs uh, test. Hey Carolyn, hey Donna, glad you guys are joining. Uh, post questions if you have them, please share. So your TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, that's the most common one that's tested. Hey Donna, um, you know I bet I look crazy. I bet that sounds crazy. I'm like talking, and, but people's things come by. They're like, hi, and you guys don't see them, and so I'm just I sound like I'm schizophrenic up here, <laughs> which maybe I am. Mmm. You never really know, right? Well, if you question, then it's probably not true. So. Most docs will test that hormone, TSH, but it, TSH is not a thyroid hormone. It's not. It's a guess. Uh, now, it gives you a good idea, but it's not always true, especially when it's normal. And so um, that TSH goes from here all the way to your thyroid, and then it stimulates it. It's always the opposite. If your thyroid is not doing its job, thyroid stimulating hormone from the brain is going to yell at it. So it's going to be like, you need to make some more, right? So TSH will be high, lots of stimulation because the thyroid's not doing its job. Then, if it's overproducing, like mine used to, then it'll just whisper like, dude, you're doing good, just maybe settle down a little bit, right? And those ranges for like TSH, I mean, they can go from like, I don't know what it was, 0.5 or something, all the way to six. Like, it's this amazing thing, right? One of my favorite pictures of cartoons is this doctor that's looking at this range on the wall this big and then he's like pointing at right there you go he's pointing right here and says hey you're a normal good good job and then the patient's just on the floor like like that so right are you treating labs or you're treating patients so we always t told uh, docs that when we teach the courses you treat patients not labs so if the patient looks hypothyroid they're probably hypothyroid. In that huge ass range for the entire population, that's not normal. And what's really funny is they change these ranges slightly all the time. And really from one lab to another, sometimes it's very different. Um, but they change them based on what we currently see. So they're not really reference ranges or normal, uh, let's say they're not normal ranges, they're expected ranges. So in a dumb fat population in America, that has crappy thyroid functioning, what do we expect to see? <laughs> That's not normal. So we want functional range, right? Functional range is, is the real one. And that tightens up. That tightens up quite a bit. So I tend to want to have TSH from the brain to the thyroid to be about uh, maybe one to two, closest to about two. Now for other, you know, again, there's a little leeway where you just have to kind of look at the patient and say what's right for them. So TSH is not a thyroid hormone. It's a guess to see how the thyroid's working. Then you actually have thyroid hormones, right? And thyroid hormones are very simple. You just have this tyrosine block, which is just uh, an amino acid, and it has three iodines on there. Then it's T3, or triiodothyroxine, so three. If it has four iodine, it's called T, mm, T7, T, oh, T4, T4. So. Hmm, T3, T4. So it's very easy. Three people in the car, four people in the car. But, well, we'll talk more about that. So T3, T4. So nice and easy. It's just tyrosine and three iodines. So, so simple. Easy to get in your diet. We'll talk about that too. So your thyroid then, based on that stimulation, is going to make three major things. It's going to make reverse T3, which does a big fat nothing for you. It's like a backflow system. Then you have T3, which is, again tyrosine with three iodines. Then you have T4. Now most docs will test TSH, which is just a guess, and then test T4. But the reason they test T4 is because they're typically just looking at uh, Synthroid, which is a T4 synthetic. So that's really just med management at that point. And that's because T4 doesn't do much of anything for you. T4 is not cool enough to get in the party uh, to really do a lot, right? So T4 converts to T3 because T3, mm, that's the cool one, right? So um, so like T3 would be, or T4 would be like 98 degrees, and then uh, T4, no, I'm sorry, T4 would be 98 degrees, and T3 would be Backstreet Boys. <laughs> 
terrible reference. Mm. So, so T4 mostly converts to T3. So 90% uh, of T4 will convert to T3. So then T3 becomes really, really important. So a really good doctor might test T3, but hmm, the only problem with that is 99.6% of T3 is bound to thyroglobulin and useless. So the crazy thing about it is that T3, all this T4 converts to T3, T3 converts to T3. Oh, I know. Is it, which one, which, uh, uh, wait a minute, just a second. Uh, I got an idea. All right, so Terry says, hey Terry, um, you taking care of Jim? Mm-hmm. Uh, is it hereditary? So thyroid is not really hereditary. Most everything's not hereditary. Thyroid dramatically became epidemic in the 1990s. And we'll talk about why that is. Let me write that down. 1990s. Which I don't want to brag, but that was the best decade. Um, and out of the girls I've dated, they always seem to be 90s girls. So I think I might have a, a theme or something. So thyroid is... Yeah, so thyroid is a systemic issue, is what Linda's asking. It's actually a, a secondary problem. Uh, so we'll talk more about that, but thyroid is rarely a thyroid problem. Thyroid is almost always a cortisol exhaustion problem. So the solution is not really dealing with the thyroid. The solution is dealing with the lifestyle that's incompatible with life longevity. So we'll talk more about that. I have a, it's on my list. So, <clears throat> all right. Which group is, I think it's NSYNC. It's gotta be NSYNC. All right, so T, T3 is an NSYNC. Okay, so 99%, 99.6% of all T3 or NSYNC is bound to thyroglobulin and useless, right? What's the only thing that really mattered with NSYNC? Justin Timberlake. He's 0.4% of that group. I don't know if that's, that doesn't sound accurate, but only 0.4% of that total T3 is actually bioactive it's free it's not bound to anything and that's what goes to every single cell and creates every single change in everything that you really want now does free t4 do a little bit yeah but not much not much at all t3 free is your main thing so your best doctor is going to test uh t3 free because that's really what the hell's going on so t3 free is just tyrosine with three iodines that is not bound to anything. So it's, it's, it actually goes and hits receptors and does stuff. So that's the Justin Timberlake of your thyroid, right? Um, so then the range for that ends up being about 2.2 to about 4.2. So it's a, it's a pretty tight range there. But what's really interesting that I've found over the years is that even if people are within that normal range, even though it's a smaller range than that TSH1, right? Now we're dealing with a little bit narrower range. That T4, T, sorry, that T3 free um, is about 2.2 to 4.2. But but 3.0 and above, is t that tends to be where people feel great. So if they're 2.8, 2.4, 2.2, they may still be within normal, but they do not feel good. They are not functioning well. Now, typically, if we're, at, we're wanting this much function, and we're only going to provide this much uh, nutrition and, and to support that. So it's, it's kind of balanced that way. But what we want to do then is to say, okay, well, if T3 free, or Justin Timberlake, is not performing as well as it should, because, again, the patient's symptomatic, but within normal, they're low functioning normal, which again, typically is not treated, but that's like saying, ask your mechanic, like, hey, is my tire popping yet? And they're like, no, the treads are showing, everything's everything's still, the air's still inside. So you just keep going and when it blows out, then come on down, we'll get you all fixed up here, right? So same thing with your thyroid. Are we gonna let it go down and get out of range? Or are we gonna just fix it and tighten up that range so the patient feels better? Right? We want them to feel no brain fog, smart, you know, sleep well, have sexuality, right? The libido, um, and brain function, memory, mood. 
So, <clears throat> so let's see. Oh, so then if we say, well, maybe there's not enough T3 total to have enough extra for T3 free. So then we say, well, what would be the problem there? And typically the most common thing that you see is that T4 is not converting to T3. And the reason it's not converting to T3 is almost always because of prolonged cortisol. So if we have chronic stress that we just kind of skin or box get used to, or we just like, oh, I will cope and get through this and I will just suck it up and uh, you know pull myself up by my bootstraps because I'm American. I don't have to have a leisure and enjoyment and vacations and hour lunch breaks and vacation. <laughs> That's crazy talk. I got a TV, right? So that, that cortisol is going to prevent that conversion of T4 into T3, which then leaves less of that 0.4% to become the free bioidentical, uh, free bioactive ones that makes you feel awesome. Oh, I need to put that on here too, BHRT. Um, so, it's not usually a really thyroid problem. It is almost always a cortisol problem, and a cortisol problem is, I stress more than I should. I live a lifestyle that's incompatible with life longevity. I can't cope anymore. So we really wanna fix that. And cortisol will pick up, and within this normal range, it'll go, and then we're like, we can do it all, and then I'm just like hyper-functioning, and then I burn out, and then I feel crappy. So then the thyroid comes in and says, as that cortisol is, is tanking, thyroid tries to pick up, and if it's tested here, it's too high. Let's cut that thing out. Once it crashes, then it's too low, let's just give you thyroid. So what's the problem then with giving thyroid? Why not, right? Just give some bioidenticals. It's all good. It's all good in the hood. Right? That's the old school clinical nutrition kind of practice. Test the hormone. If it's low, just give them hormones. We don't want to do synthetics because synthetics are toxic. Um, we wouldn't really want to give like a bioidentical, especially like a T3, T4, uh, DID, MID mix. That's great. Just take it from a, an animal like a pig, a porcine, or a cow, uh, grind it up, and then put it in a pill and give it to people. So we can do that, or we can make a me medication from it. Like, Westroid or Armour Thyroid. But if you remember back a few talks ago, we talked about negative feedback. And the most everything in the body works off ne negative feedback except for two things, uh, birth in a baby and clotting a um, blood vessel. Because those have very distinct starts and stops. So if you are, <laughs> there's no arm here, <laughs> all right. So <laughs> if you are um, uh, bleeding, you want it to end, and then that's done. If you are birthing a baby, you want that baby to just pop out, and then you want all the bleeding, all the placenta stuff to get out, and then everything's done, Every, the, 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 everything tightens back up, and, and then you're back to normal, right? So those two things have, um, oh shoot, you guys have been saying other things here. Okay. I date a doctor who knows about thyroid issues. I like the sound of that. Nope, not in the 90s, girl. That's terrible. I'm sorry, I, when I moved that thing up, it didn't uh, do more, so let me... Can a T3 be tested accurately when you're on Synthroid? Well, it can, but it's really gonna be, how well is it converting, because you're taking synth uh, synthetic uh, T4. So Deb Anderson had that question, can T3 uh, be tested accurate? So T3 free can, because that's all you really care about in the end on there. Uh, Denise Ware, uh, this is my first lecturing. Uh, where are you doing your nursing lectures? Uh, so no, I used to teach the post-grad uh, uh, post for the functional medicine clinical nutrition course. Um, I used to teach uh, pre-nursing students with the A&P program. All right, Donna, and I'll, I'll look at yours offline and give you some ideas on that too. Um, what about antibodies? We'll talk about that, Lynn. Well, you guys are posting a lot. You guys are awesome. All right, uh, I keep hearing about, uh, yeah, naltroxone. You don't want to do that. That's terrible. All right, so you guys have some clinical questions that I'll add in at the very end there. Um, okay, so armor better than uh, Synthroid, yeah. So it is, but okay, so, so 
So let's talk about synthetic hormone replacement therapy and bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So it's just like any kind of hormone that you take. Hormones and neurotransmitters downregulate if you put extras in. So the typical clinical nutrition uh, program is uh, it test it. If it's low, give it to them. But negative feedback says that if I am making more, then I will make less. And then I make too little, and then I'll make more. And it's overproduce, underproduce, overproduce, within a normal range. That's how the body works, through negative feedback. So if you give the body an exogenous source, so whether it's synthetic uh, or whether it's um, natural or bioidentical, like armor, um, you're gonna downregulate your own production. So you'll feel great in the beginning and then you'll downregulate the rest of that little bit that you have left and then you'll feel like crap and then they'll just increase the dose. It's not a problem, we'll just increase that dose. And then you'll feel good for a while and then it'll go crappy and then maybe double dose and maybe twice a day and you know, we'll just kind of do that and maybe throw in something else. But eventually you will get to a point where it doesn't work anymore. And I have lots of patients that come in and they're on like lots of thyroid and other stuff and, and they still feel like crap, right? because they're down-regulating their, own, down -regulating their own production. And everything within uh, medication has what's called the predictable half-life. So, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, maybe. Uh, and that's basically how long does it take before half the medication is excreted through either the uh, liver or kidneys. So, that being said, eventually if you down-regulate enough and completely rely on that uh, either bioidentical or that uh, medication, then eventually you don't have any flexibility. And so if that is downregulating at a predictable rate through your uh, liver or kidneys, then you need extra, it's not gonna be there. So we got a solution for that. Uh, when you can't uh, take any more, we'll just give you, what, uh, antidepressants? 70% of those end up more antidepressed, or uh, sorry, more depressed. And then uh, Abilify that said that's not a problem because you can just take an antipsychotic for that. It's all good. So, Deb says, can you repair enough to get off thyroid meds? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have the gland, it works. It's just a matter of figuring out what you're doing to mess it up, stop doing those things, feed the thyroid, and it works. All right, Carrie says, what's the best supplements for a healthy thyroid? So prevention, we'll talk about that. Prevention, prevention. Good question, Carrie. All right, so um, my focus is always what's called functional lifestyle medicine. And part of that, and, and people that know me or, or my patients, they know, you know, out of all the postdocs that I've been to, and all, you know, I got four postdoctoral diplomates, but the, the one that's the best that ever, or the best course that ever changed my life and changed my practice was the lifestyle medicine program courses I did at Harvard. Because those were the very first ones that said, patient has this condition, what are they doing to fix it? Or sorry, excuse me, patient has this condition, what are they doing to cause it? And that was amazing because that's the first time I really ever heard that. And then the goal was to figure out what causes it, stop doing those things, and then you have what's called restorative physiology, and the body's designed to restore itself, right? So. The main thing I do is figure out what are we doing to mess it up, stop doing that. That's the easiest solution in the world. It's also the cheapest way to fix thyroid. Uh, Rhonda has a good question here. Why do thyroid tests uh, show up negative but have lots of sy <laughs> symptoms? And that's usually because they have these huge ranges and they don't test the T3 free. And so the actual thing that's working for you. Uh, and that's usually what happens. They're, they're treating laboratory values not treating a patient with that. So, a few things here. Um, some people have goiters, some people have uh, nodules down there. So, you know, when they look up, you see this big old, so that, you know how like the Americans have the uh, uh, spare tire? They'll have a neck spare tire that's all swollen here. So, uh, they might have a goiter there, they might have like a little nodule. And if you think about this, as your, your thyroid's uh, not performing very well, uh, basically the goal is just build more of it. And when they build more of it, then all of a sudden you have more room. It becomes a space-occupying lesion as it starts to grow more and more to deal with all the crappy lifestyle that we have. So we end up 
causing us to add on to the thyroid, which then we call that a goiter or a nodule. Um, a lot of times those are iodine deficiency, which we really don't want to treat with iodine. And I know that's a controversial thing to say to some docs. Uh, we want to eat thyroid. <laughs> if we give thyroid, we cause problems. But if we eat thyroid, then our body self-regulates. Slim deficiency, but really that's because we don't eat real food. So, you know, one Brazil nut, one Brazil nut, or two halves, or four quarters, gives you 100% of your slim needs. Like, that's how easy it is to get selenium. So, um, if you eat crap, it's going to be a hard one. But And then autoimmune inflammation, which we'll, we'll talk about that too um, as we go through this. But So... A couple things of things that are toxic to your thyroid. Um, you know, your thyroid is um, uh, tyrosine with iodine. So what interferes with iodine? And one thing is, do we even eat the iodine? Which most Americans are not eating iodine. So iodine comes from the ocean. So it's uh, sea salt. So if you get real actual sea salt, uh, you will get iodine and sea salt should be dirty, right? Just like your uh, Uncle Fred. So, you know, at the family gatherings, he's the one that tells the dirty jokes. That's real salt. So, real salt should have 40 to 80 other minerals, and that's what gives it that wonderful color. So, like, <laughs> try black salt. Black salt's pretty awesome. Uh, it's called in the muck, smells like sulfur, tastes fantastic when you use it to cook. Um, it's a little odd to start using, but. Anybody else use colinamook or black salt? And then, uh, and then the uh, pink salt, right? Yeah, pink salt. So it has all these other minerals. So 40 to 80 other minerals plus iodine from real sea salt. Now, if you buy salt that's perfectly clear, that is crap. That's man-made. Salt is not clear. So uh, don't get that stuff where they basically put it together. They cleanse it, purify it, and put it back together. So getting iodine, uh, also the plants in the ocean that get the iodine. So that's where your seaweed, your kelp, your doles. Um, yeah, so Amber says she uses pink salt, so Himalayan salt. That's a great one. It's just great. It's easy. There's red salt, black salt, brown salt. It's all good. Um, I know a lot of Republicans probably only want white salt, but, you know, you got to diversify. You can't be xenosaltphobic. So... All right, that's my joke. All right, that's it. So, uh, the plants then. So you can put like uh, dried wakimi or dried kale in your soups and sauces and stews and it really doesn't change the flavor. You can snack on it, it's really great. You can buy nori paper, which is what we do see, uh, sushi rolls. Uh, so people like Ashley, who's all sushi all the time girl, um, she loves those California rolls and everybody else does. And so you just, I got, I got a bazooka at home that you make these with, but, um, so you can roll those bad boys up and, uh, that paper then is, has iodine in it. So it's a great way. Our kids just sit there and eat the iodine like that. Or they eat the paper like a snack. I actually fed it to my cat. Well, sorry. I left it on the counter and then the cats fed on my nori paper. And that's cool because you can get that Walmart, Dillon's, whatever, Asian store, it doesn't matter. Um... Well, Marcia, so you say you're allergic to kale, but no, kelp, kelp from the ocean. So uh, a little different than kale. kale. Kale's from the farm. Kelp's from the ocean farm. All right. So now your best one for thyroid, though, is uh, uh, kelp. So kelp and I think Wakimi is about the same. They have about 3,000 micrograms of iodine. 3,000. Oh, Marcia says and kelp. Oh, that sucks. Well, there's doles and nori and some other ones you can do. But uh, kelp and, and wakimi have about um, 3,000 micrograms of iodine in there, right? The, the country that gets the most is uh, Japan, and they get 12,000. So that's only like three teaspoons. So you put a teaspoon in your soup, sauces, stews, um, you're going to get a ton of extra iodine that way. And then the fish in the ocean that eat the plants that live in the salt, they're going to be full of iodine too. So that's where your wild caught salmon, tuna, halibut, mackerel, cod, sardines, that's where those come into play too. So most countries, um, you know, 85% of the world's population lives near the coast 
and they eat the fish and the plants from the ocean. Americans consume more coffee than fish, so we should have thyroid problems because we don't get enough iodine. So we purify the salt, we don't eat the fish, we don't eat the plants. It should be hard for us to get iodine. So that's the first part because again, tyrosine plus three iodines, if you don't have the iodines, you're kind of screwed. And iodine does this. So when you eat, think of all these buckets. You have a bucket in your brain, a bucket in your breast, and a few other places. And then when you eat iodine-rich food, it saturates those buckets. And then it overflows to the next buckets, overflow, and then you pee out the rest. So it's a wonderful system that we have uh, that self-regulates. The only time we really see problems is if people artificially or exogenously take iodine as a supplement for thyroid, and that can cause a uh, some problems. The other thing then is iodine is a halide. So on the periodic table in chemistry that everybody hated, there's a row of things called halides. And all halides compete for the same receptors. So that's your bromine, your chlorine, your fluorine. So not fluorine, not pergo, right? Fluorine, like fluoride, there you go. So those ones, those halides, all compete so they can really mess things up because if you have bromine bind to that iodine receptor or chlorine or fluorine, and this is one of the questions we had earlier, was what if my labs look beautiful but I feel horribly hypothyroid? Well, it doesn't test if bromine's on there or fluorine or chlorine versus iodine. So you could be making perfect levels, uh, but they, they could have not iodine on there, and that would be a mess. That, that, that would be horrible symptomatically, right? So fluoride, where do we get fluoride from? Uh, you guys tell me where everybody's getting this excess fluoride from because in nature it's, there's not very much. And then we'll talk more about that. What about bromine? So bromine and all these things, the bromine, chlorine, and fluorine, these are all things that will make us fat and dumb because they mess with thyroid. So in most countries they ban, ban these things. Um, yeah, Brianna, toothpaste, Fluoride, so I always get fluoride free. Which, by the way, I've been I brushed with that charcoal. I look like a crazy person. Uh, Deb says water, so a lot of places fluoridate the water. So Newton does that, but uh, Wichita doesn't. Um, so, um, so uh, co you know, uh, companies that brominate bread, uh, uh, like in America they make people dumb and fatter because bromine makes it wider, fluffier, so it's more profitable. We use slightly less ingredients. So the people that own the company or have stock, they, they make a killing off this. But population that consumes it makes them dumb and fat. Oh yeah, dental office is a good place for fluoride, getting ex that excess fluoride, Brianna. So, um, so like in Singapore, you can get a half, uh, 12 years in prison and half a million dollar fine uh, for brominating the bread because they don't want a dumb fat population. So they don't do that. In uh, America, we celebrate that. When it comes to like chlorine, uh, we drink recycled poo water. So we get filter out all the corn and all the poo particles, but then we have bacteria poo water. So we don't want that. So we just bleach it. Well, sometimes you stir in your faucet, it smells like bleach. Uh, that's because it's bleach. And so that Chlorine interferes with your thyroid. So every time you drink that, you, you're messing with your thyroid. You're getting dumber and fatter. If you get too dumb and fat, you gotta move to the south where you're smart and skinny. You should probably not say that so much on, it's funnier in the office because everybody's from Kansas or other countries and stuff. Always northern for some reason. I have a lot of southern patients come up here for some reason. So we just make fun of that. But I'm from Texas, so I can say it, All right? Um, so, Chlorine, fluoride. yeah, so in Europe and other countries, they use dichloride, so it's chlorine bound to chlorine, and so then it doesn't end up causing you to get dumb and fat, and mess up your thyroid. Oh, Rhonda's a southerner, not your part of the south, that other part of the south, you know, the other part. Um, so, why don't we do it? Why, why do we just use chlorine that's free and, and the halide that's gonna mess with your thyroid? Well, the dichloride costs a tiny bit more, so let's just make our population messed up thyroid-wise and uh, save a few bucks, you know? And then, uh, let's see, chlorine, fluorine, bromine, so let's go back to fluoride then. 
fluoride, the, the type that they use in the um, water system, is actually the waste product from uh, aluminum manufacturing. So that seems like a great idea. Uh, and it's toxic. I mean, literally you had to have uh, hazmat certified drivers, hazmat certified trucks, dump that in the hazmat, hazmat certified dumping place because it's so uh, caustic and corrosive. Uh, and it also studies a long time ago, showed this, but it's true today, is that uh, fluoride is more neurotoxic than lead because it has such a damaging effect on your thyroid. So, um, yeah, so Terry has a great question, where do we get our water from, you know? Because if you, if you look at bread by itself, bread is fluoridated, chlorinated, and brominated. That's crazy. So have just one RO system in your sink, maybe under your uh, kitchen sink, and have one spigot. Just make sure it uses generic filters, and it um, uh, has a fast refill time. They're usually about 300 bucks, something like that. Yeah, Brianna, so yeah, get an RO system. And then, you know, if push comes to shove and you can't afford that, then just get an RO kind of like a, what, a Brita Zero uh, thing. And so that's plastic. So we're going to filter out the chemicals in a plastic container, which is funny. So filter that and in the fridge so it's cold so it's less likely to absorb anything. And then pour it into a glass pitcher and then put it in the sink. Uh, put it in the, the fridge so it's cold. And actually, uh, you guys should look up something called a... Watercraft with tumbler, and so I actually have a patient that we're trying to figure out what this was because I have one of these. But uh, in Europe, you know, you have this little glass container like this, which is a craft, and then it has a glass cup on top that seals it, and you have filled with water. So if you get one that's about a quart, then you know you drank one quart. So you can keep it on your desk, drink it, it looks fancy, and then when people say, "What is that?" you can act like, "You don't know what that is. It's a half craft with tumbler, dog." <laughs> So, that's like being vegan. You get to look down on people. <laughs> so you get a half craft with tumbler for your water consumption and then you act all indignant that people don't know what that is. That's what I do. Give them my secrets out. All right. BPA is another one. So bisphenol A or, or plastic number seven that's, that messes up your thyroid. Uh, in fact, the Yale University studies show that uh, plastic water bottles that have BPA or those Nalgene's or those Camelback hard ones, uh, they are bisphenol A and they will mess up your thyroid and they actually lower IQ too. So don't get BPS, don't get BPA free typically because that's just as toxic. Drink out of glass, right? Get a nice glass uh, drinking water bottle with a rubber on the outside so it knocks over it won't break or anything like that. Then you don't have to worry about that BPA or a nice stainless steel uh, one will be fine. So the other thing is petrochemicals and some of the stuff is like fertilizers are notorious for messing up uh, thyroid. So you got to be careful about that. That's why I do my gardening. I have my little uh, herb garden going, right? And uh, my purple basil dyed. I was excited about tasting that, but it, it didn't survive. And then... Um, um, hey, Dan Gordon's on. Where did Dan Gordon go? He disappeared and now he's back on. He hasn't been on here in a long time. Um, now, let's talk about a few things. So these are things that mess up the thyroid, right? D direct chemicals that mess this up. So we want to be very careful. No more bromine, no more chlorine, no more fluorine. Um, maybe RO as much as we can. So then what about soy? <laughs> I... I'd like to, I don't know. I think I should just go to uh, seminars and, and mention soy is excellent for the body and just see how many people get all mad. So um, soy, let's talk about two things. Soy and cruciferous vegetables like brassicas. These are the two red-headed stepchilds that, that they just get beaten up so badly and there's so much conflicting research. Is it good? Is it bad? It's all this kind of stuff. And, you know, what is it? So... <laughs> So this is what we do as a population, as Americans, um, is we, we basically will take a bunch of synthetic estrogens like plastic, bisphenol A, um, birth control pills, synthetic hormone replacement therapy. There are high, ester lots of dairy, high estradiols, which causes people to get autoimmune, which causes people to get estrogen changes because it's estradiol mimicking, mineral grow breast, all that kind of stuff. 
And then we'll turn around and say, don't eat, don't, nope, don't eat soy because it has phytoestrogens. And that's probably why everybody's growing man boobs and uh, prostate's growing back in the uteruses and uh, women having all these endometriosis, fibroids, and all that kind of stuff. It can't be all the synthetics that we absolutely know cause that. It must be this food that we've eaten for thousands of years. Oh, then we think, well, what about the countries that eat this all the time? Oh my God, they must be riddled with estrogenic kit. Oh, they're not, they're not. Oh, sorry about that. So it's American men they're growing boobies, uh, not Japanese men. Is that a Jap, Chinese, Japanese, what are these, right? So man boobs, so there's American boobs, right? So, uh, well, yeah. So, although it's very comforting to hold yourself at night with your man boobs, uh, we probably don't want them. So it, it's the number one elective surgery in the United States for men, number one. So, it's not soy doing that. Soy has phytoestrogens. The same people that tell you don't eat uh, soy because of phytoestrogens will tell you to eat flaxseed. And flaxseed has way more phytoestrogens. Coffee has phytoestrogens. Everything that is healthy that they also prescribe is going to have phytoestrogens. And phytoestrogens balance out estrone and estril, not estradiol. And those are the ones that protect you against the estrogenic uh, effects. So it's ridiculous. Stop eating synthetic estradiols and start eating phytoestrogens that protect you against those plastics. That's why other countries don't have these problems, uh, but they can eat it. And then we take a bunch of synthetics and then we blame it on the food. Same thing with cruciferous. Holy crap, man. People are like, don't eat lectins. Don't eat nightshades. Don't eat this. What do you got left? You got nothing. There's nothing left. We pick apart every single thing and we demonize the foods for all these little components that are not really the problem. Now for a handful of people, it might be a problem, but for the vast majority, it's not a problem. So cruciferous vegetables do not mess with the thyroid. They do not cause problems for the thyroid. In fact, there are tons of research articles that will break down those chemicals and tell you what they do great for the thyroid. Um, I was reading Furman's thing, and I don't like some of these people's philosophies, but. I mean, he, he was saying the same thing. I like, I like the kind of way he was going with that. Um, and I think he even said, and I don't know if this is true, I hate saying there's none, but he's like, there is zero research out there that shows consumption of actual cruciferous vegetables or soy have interfered with thyroid production. But there are tons of research out there that shows synthetic estradiol, bromine, chlorine, fluorine, and BPA that they definitely do mess with that. So I don't like the unknowns of blaming food. That's crazy talk. It's food, food racism, foodist, foodism, mm. anti-foodism. That's what it is. Okay, I'm gonna calm it down. Mess up my thyroid here. So it's not the food. Now, again, if you're gonna eat soy, eat genetically, I'm sorry, non-genetically modified, organic tofu, organic tempeh. Don't eat, don't be skinny bitch like with those, that book Skinny Bitch, where it's just like, don't eat meat because it's all processed. Uh, eat these, eat tofu that becomes turkey. That doesn't make sense. Don't do that either. So if you want to eat meat, eat meat. If you want to be a vegetarian, be a vegetarian. But don't be a transgerian. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to get in trouble for all this. So, medicine-wise, we said T4, T3. We don't want to do that because it downregulates. We don't want to do desiccated thyroid, which I used to love that stuff in the beginning, but it messes you up. It messes you up. And then, you know, okay, so I think someone asked, well, what could you take? And, you know, if you wanted to take stuff, because I got, you know, some people want to. Selenium, or you can eat a Brazil nut. One Brazil nut. Uh, D3, or you could go out in the sunlight. <laughs> you don't want to do that. We're Americans. Then iodine, or you can eat iodine-rich food. and Put like one teaspoon of kelp a day. Zinc, or you could pretty much eat anything. that has uh, any, Everything has zinc. Tyrosine, or you could eat food. Or omega-3, or you could eat fish. So if you want to take things, that's your standard. Selenium, D3, iodine, zinc, tyrosine, omega-3. Uh, used to, I did this and other docs do it, is do progesterone cream, do bioidentical progesterone because it's going to help balance you out. But why the hell is your progesterone exhausted 
because your cortisol is stealing progesterone because it goes cholesterol into pregnenolone into progesterone into cortisol. If your cortisol steals all your progesterone, uh, should you take more progesterone or should you stop exhausting your cortisol? Well, we used to say, eh, you're American, just keep it up and just take more progesterone. But that ends up down-regulating down -regulating your own production. So then that cortisol problem becomes worse and worse and eventually you can't, you can't naturally medicate it anymore. So, you know, the old school treatment that I used to use in, in kind of clinical nutrition, it causes more problems than benefits. So then we come to, okay, so we, uh, BHRT prevention. All right, so I think Devlin asked this a while back, but uh, what can we do to prevent thyroid problems? So 1990s is when we started having this sudden epidemic of thyroid problems. And they did this because back in the 90s, uh, we had these huge tech stocks that were blowing up, right? People were getting filthy rich. Silicon Valley just went crazy. We had lots of money. So these hedge funds, made it, hedge fund, hedge fund managers, I think this was in the book History of Food, uh, or Eating History, um, you know, they said, uh, they went around to other companies that made pretty good returns, but then said, how can you make more returns? And sugar is more addicting than crack cocaine, so that's why several years ago when I heard those studies, I switched to crack, so <laughs> I'm not going to use sugar, that's for crazy people. So, so now I'm hooked on crack and these are all false teeth, that's... I can't even see them on the thing. It's all that charcoal toothpaste. So, now the cracks got me all itchy and stuff. Um, oh, yeah, so, what if we take some crack and put it in the food that normally doesn't have the crack in there, and suddenly, uh, we started seeing sugar in everything. And then all of a sudden, it became uh, a thyroid problem. So, with that, we went from like just eating really food, but we, you know, we, we'd still eat 150 pounds of added sugar, all that maltodextrin and, and um, what was it, 50 different names for sugar that we've created. So like we'd eat Cheetos, which has says sugar on there once, but we had seven other names for sugar that then ended up uh, becoming sugar on that label that we just kind of, yeah, just hide it, you don't even know about that. So they just flat out started adding sugar shit. So all of a sudden we had all this extra sugar and things that didn't have sugar and thyroid problems went through the roof with that. So that's because thyroid, like we said before, is not a primary problem. Thyroid is a secondary problem because of chronic exhaustion of cortisol. We just live a lifestyle that's incompatible with life longevity. So that's why I'm reading my book here, right? So I put on my fancy little happy socks and uh, then I go to the bookstore and I get my little uh, the coconut tea. And then I go, <laughs> Ashley says she loves Tito's. Um, have you got to try the um, chickpea Cheetos? They, even have, they have some at Starbucks that I ate. I thought they were pretty good for Cheeto-ish taste. I think soon you liked them. They're, Again, they're not perfect, but they were they were good, and they I think they were vegan. I don't think they have even cheese in them. I don't know what was in them, but it was all safe ingredients. But it was good. So you have to try those, not bad cheese. So this book, Happiness. So then I was reading my Happiness book, and it's great. And I'm reading my uh, other brain book and uh, something else too now. So that's my chill out time, right? So I'm down de-stressing my cortisol. I go for my walks. I do my meditation. I do my yoga. And all of a sudden, all that ex hormone exhaust, or say extra hormones, decrease. And then thyroid functions better. And that's kind of funny. We should calm down to increase our basal metabolic rate so we can lose weight and be healthier and more energetic. But we don't think about that as Americans. So a lot of the talks we've done in the past, we're talking about how to, well, okay, not me, but a lot, okay, so me, I'm always like, oh, yeah. It's not your thyroid, it's stress. Let's talk about stress reduction, right? Let's talk about mandala coloring. Let's talk about meditation. Let's talk about mindfulness. Let's talk about the pause. Let's talk about, you know, the idea of like being okay and forgiving yourself, right? The, like, not worrying too much about what, you know, what's going to happen before it happens. All these things that, uh, you know, as, as Americans, we get exhausted. So it's not, it goes to that, not my circus, not my monkeys. It goes to the serenity prayer. What can I change? What can I not change? Sometimes you kind of have to put yourself out there and say, hey, this is what it is. 
and I'm okay if you don't agree with this, or I'm okay if it doesn't work out, or it's okay if it all falls apart. It's okay, because life is messy, and that's the reality of it. So, you don't have to stress over all the things that you can't control. That's why that serenity prayer is really cool, because it says, let me know what things I can change, what things I cannot change, and let me know the difference, right? And most people are not my circus, or sorry, most people are, uh, don't know the, not my circus, not my monkeys. And I, I love my patients that just, you know, they, they say, when something comes up, they're like, that's, that's what I say in my head. And so, um, it, it's this crazy thing of like, someone brings their drama to you, and you go, um, is that my circus? Is that my monkeys? No. And I'll tell you, my whole life, my whole life was lots of stress because I was going to fix and rescue people. Always. I had this horrible childhood. I had all this nonsense go on. And so I thought, I'm going to save someone else. Only to find out you can't save anybody else. You could only save yourself. Just like those people that, you know, they get so exhausted. I have so many patients that are so exhausted because the world is this horrible place for them. Right? That people cutting them off, people driving slowly. You are not that important in life. Who cares? You get there five minutes later, it's fine. Why are you going to exhaust your hormones because someone drives slower? Somebody accidentally cuts you off and now you're going to have a heart attack? That's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. You don't have to save anybody. You don't have to fix anybody. You just have to figure out how do I become happier as a person with who I am. And that's it. That is the true fix for thyroid. Now, next week, what we want to talk about is we will talk about autoimmune thyroid. I know people have questions about that. And I'll answer, you guys keep posting your questions because I'll, I'll, I'll address those. But um, next week, uh, let's talk about autoimmune thyroid, so Hashimoto's and Graves' disease specifically. So we'll talk about that T cell dysregulation. We'll talk about um, molecular mimicry, which we've talked about before, but we'll talk about specifically for thyroid, and then we'll talk about how we can eat for thyroid a little bit better, um, and then how we can stop exhausting hormones too. Maybe we'll have Scott on for this one, I'm not sure. Or Connie, Connie would be great. So, you know, that's that part of reading these things, getting those little points. So when we talk about Thyroid is almost always secondary. It's almost always secondary to cortisone exhaustion. Progesterone exhaustion is secondary to cortisone exhaustion. We live in this constant inadequacy. We live in this constant fear society. We try to do more than we can, and we can't do that for very long. So the average age by the time someone becomes hormonally exhausted to where they can't eat enough sugar, they can't eat enough wheat or dairy, they can't comfort, they can't distract, it's about 35 years of age now. That is crazy incompatible with life longevity, and especially it's incompatible, oh, I'm sorry, incompatible, incompatible with thyroid function. We are not living th for our thyroid, and that's why other countries don't have to worry about how, well, what am I gonna do for my thyroid? Well, let's just bike today. Let's go to the park today. Let's just be okay with ourselves today. And it took me a long time and a lot of pain and a lot of frustration to really get to this point where you just be who you are and be okay with that. And you know, it's funny because that meditation group, that meditation group, the idea of like pausing before something happens, that when pain comes, you lean into it, that when the waves come and try to knock you down, you just lean into the waves, but you don't try to keep the waves down. You cannot control what everybody else does. And the more that you become accepting of who you are, where you're at, your current reality, not coulda, shoulda, woulda, the more you stay away from other people's circus and their monkeys, the more you spend on what can I control and what I cannot control, so you can basically say, look, this is, this is what's going on, I can't control this, but I'm going to address it, and then I'm going to move on and deal with things that I can control. The more you do that, the better thyroid you will have. And so we'll talk more about that, because you have the greatest control over your thyroid, but it's all about exhaustion of cortisol. It's all about how you think, how you react. And we'll talk about the amygdaloid still, which is what most people's problems end up becoming. The same information comes in, but does it go to my place of fear and anger? 
Or does it go to the place of, let's think about it, in the frontal lobe? And that pause is what allows that change to happen so we don't have the amygdaloid still. So I know I'm probably saying stuff that, that didn't make a whole lot of sense at this point because we haven't explained those details. But for the most part, to kind of wrap it up, rippity wrap it up, um, thyroid's very simple. Thyroid labs are not usually what they do. They don't test thyroid. They don't test the functioning thyroid. So T3 free is what you want tested. Um, you want to basically stay away from bread, but stay away from fluorine, bromine, chlorine, those other halides that are going to compete with iodine. Eat your iodine. Switch to uh, non-plastic stuff. Ditch the petrochemicals. And uh, eat lots of soy and lots of cruciferous vegetables and don't fear those. Don't take thyroid glandulars that downregulate bioidentical synthetics. Don't take things that are going to mess it up. Now, if you're on thyroid medicine, I'm not telling you to stop your thyroid medicine because if you don't fix your lifestyle, you, you're going to feel like crap. But for people that have been on thyroid for a long time, it's easy to get off once you don't need it. But all you're doing is using it to cope with the fact that you have too much cortisol production. So, And what's a good cortisol uh, substitute, Amber says? Uh, stop exhausting your cortisol. And that's, I think that's a real difference of like how much I love how I practice now. Is because it's not take this thing. It is stop doing these things that's incompatible. Now with cortisol, I will say a good substitute, it's not really a substitute, but, you know, if you have trouble sleeping, it's because of cortisol. And a lot of people are like, oh, I'm not stressed. Mm, you're just good at keeping it down. You're just becoming that Skinner box situation. So, the reality is, you can take things like adrenal adaptogens. So, like Yogi Bedtime Tea, t uh, Tension Tamer. I have a, a, a couple friends that they cannot sleep. They have all this stress, all this stuff. I mean, everything's crazy and it's just like, ah, everything's out of control. And they have found that just with a little bit of natural calm, tension tamer, and yogi uh, bedtime tea, that if they mix those together, they will sleep perfectly when they couldn't sleep before. Other people, it's just yogi bedtime tea. Other people, it's ashwagandha. Other people, it's shistasandra, rhodiola, or tulsi, or holy basil, right? So it's finding what that magic blend is for you, but again, all you're typically doing is trying to mask so you can keep doing it. So the goal is to feel better, typically through adaptogens and B vitamins, and then make some damn changes so you don't exhaust your cortisol. Stop being American. Stop being in the country that has the highest depression and the highest anxiety in the entire planet. Solarverse. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. So, adaptogens. So, Adrenosense, that's a great one to kind of balance things out. Yogi Bedtime Tea, uh, Stress Relief. I'll tell you, man, I took that freaking chamomile because I couldn't drink green tea, so I got some chamomile, which is an adapt adaptogen. And, man, I felt so mellow. I was just at work like this, just like, hmm. And so I can't do that. I have to, I, have to, I can't calm down too much. I just get too chill. So I tried Yogi Bedtime Tea when I was really stressed at my friends, and they took it away from me. Because they they're like, you act like you're drunk or high. But maybe I was drunk and high on Yogi Bhattan tea. So, oh, see, yeah, Brianna says Yogi uh, and Tulsi. Yogi, oh, see, that's her magical blend, right? Yogi and Tulsi, which is Tulsi basil. Um, uh, that really works for that person. So that's great. And, and again, don't get frustrated if you don't find that magic thing. But that's why I love with patients. It's just like, Let's try this, this, and this. Let's do the provocative test. Let's figure it out. But if you don't deal with your problems, if you don't change who you are, you don't change the way your brain functions, then that same information is going to go to the wrong place, cause the same exhaustion, and eventually that may not work for you anymore. Or you just take more and more. So we'll talk about all that. We'll hold your hand, get you through this. It'll be all right. We all suffer. We all get better. It's all part of the human experience. We just got to be there for get together. And that's why I love these uh, live feeds because like, just like Brianna and stuff and all the rest of you guys, you know, you guys are offering answers to each other of things that work for you. And that's good. And I have my opinions and I give my clinical expertise, but it's not always what may work for that person. So, you know, that's why I love the community of this. All right. 
Keep posting questions. I'll answer those offline. I don't think I answered last week, but I will. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, practice de-stressing. Get yourself a little happy book or a... I can't remember the other book that I was reading. It was great. But those kind of books about... Um, you know, how how stress affects us and how we find happiness and joy and how we change how we think. That's the real stuff. That's the real shizzle, okay? Dan's back to moonshine. I like this guy. So, Dan, we'll have to have martini someday. You have your moonshine martini. I have my little gimlet. Be all good. Um, glad you guys joined us. Um, feel free to keep posting questions. If, if you have some clinical stuff, I'll try to answer. But I'm really glad you guys joined us. I'm really glad this is a topic that meant something to you guys. And uh, there's Carol Farrow. Um, and uh, Carrie says, see you later, mate. Crikey. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys. Have a good week. And next week, we'll talk about autoimmune, T-cell dysregulation, molecular mimicry. And maybe I'll draw it all out. Uh, like that's what uh, Don always keeps wanting me to do. So uh, I might draw the whole process for you guys, and and we'll have a little uh, interesting interaction here. So all right, love you guys. Bye.